consider the parable of Jonah or the sign of sign of Jonah. One of the verses in uh, chapter uh, 11 we could consider as verse 16. And others tempting him sought a sign from heaven. Obviously those that were tempting him were that evil generation that he spoke of. Matthew also records this incident in Matthew chapter 12, reading at verse 38. And certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answering, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. He answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. But Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. If we had time this morning, we could go through the entire chapter of Matthew chapter 12. We set the background of Jesus' parable about Jonah. If we read the whole chapter, we would see the Pharisees constantly opposing the Lord. And to say they were opposing him was to really put it quite mildly. First, in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we see the incident of the corn on the Sabbath. The Pharisees saw it and they said, it is not lawful. Jesus answers them in verses 3 through 8. Next, Jesus heals the man with a withered hand. Is this lawful, they asked, seeking to accuse him? And in verse 14, the Pharisees went out to counsel on how they might destroy him. Verse 22, one possessed with the devil, he healed him. Now the Pharisees accused Jesus of being of Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. The name taken from the Hebrew to mean the Lord of the Flies. And finally, in verse 38, they asked Jesus for a sign. So it is no wonder that after this constant barrage or onslaught by the Pharisees, that Jesus would call them a evil and adulterous generation. They were like children. Show us a sign. Show us a sign, they chanted. And this was not the only time that they had sought a sign from him. In Mark chapter 8, verses 10 through 12, records that when he had come into the parts of Delmanutha, the Pharisees came forth seeking a sign from heaven. Jesus sighed in his spirit and saith, Why does this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, that shall, there shall be no sign given unto this generation.
Brother A.G. Norris, in his uh, book on Mark, gives us a little information about this. They came to the parts of Dalmanutha. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 39, where this same incident is recorded, at least the landing of Jesus and those that were with him, it's recorded in Matthew as Magadan, which is the RV or Mag- Magdalia, which is probably not right. This is identified with Tachi and is located at the eastern, located stream, western point of the Sea of Galilee. And the atlases do not have Dalmanutha listed anywhere to be found. Seems clear though that the Lord is now squarely back in Jewish territory and is immediately subject to fresh manifestations of hostility. The Lord was evidently becoming increasingly unacceptable to the rulers, and as their hostility threatened to outpace the divine program, his movements in response to this He moved sharply to and fro. We've seen him move from Galilee to Tyre and Sidon, then into Decapolis, before venturing into Galilee again. Almost immediately, we find him recrossing the sea once more to the northeastern shore in Bethsaida and then once more proceeding to the north before he takes his final journey south to suffering and death. So they saw the sign from him. What kind of a sign did they want or expect? In Matthew and Luke that we read the word sign, some line primarily used as a token. Whatever it might be, this token was demanded by the Lord's enemies and possibly hoped for by his friends. It is principally used as the actual miracles that the Lord did during his pilgrimage. It was seen then there was already an abundance of signs, some of them confessed by the rulers themselves, signs which make more signs unreasonable if they were requested, and certainly they were. So why did he not produce such a sign? or rather procure it from God so that their doubts would be permanently set at rest. Now such a sign had in fact appeared at his baptism, but it appears that it was to be seen by few. There will be further ones at the Transfiguration, but there are only three besides the one involved, would witness it. And what was emphatically a public sign came shortly before the crucifixion, when the Lord praying in the presence of the multitude, Father, glorify thy name. The reply came, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. But even when it came, it was received with skepticism. Some said it thundered. Others said an angel spoke with him. But it was a sign nonetheless. This 
voice came not for my sake, but for your sake. Whether they would receive it or not, before the Lord was delivered up, a sign from heaven was given. It was ignored, sidestepped, or rejected. So why does he now say, no sign will be given, when he had already given the sign of Jonah? It might be that since they considered the sign of Jonah as no sign at all, in other words, they regarded it as neither We regarded it as nothing. And now they wanted some other sign instead. A manifestation from heaven. This was the sign they were looking for. But neither the miracle of Jonah which was passed, nor the impending resurrection of the Lord which Jonah's sign typified, would satisfy that generation. We see then the Jewish elders receiving, I'm sorry, we see the Jewish elders seemingly ignoring Jonah and casting aside as valueless the sign of which Jesus spoke. And why was this? What was the reason? Did they despise the record of Jonah himself? Brother A.D. Norris, we quoted before, wrote the following commentary. The book of Jonah was an embarrassment to Protestant Jews. Jonah though in one of his prophecies had promised the aggrandizement of the northern Israelite kingdom of his day, found in 2 Kings 14, 23 to 25, had been set to pronounce doom against the heathen kingdom of Assyria, and, had, and he was reluctant to do so. His reason was not unwillingness from fear, but as he says himself, that he forewarned to forewarn the hated kingdom was to risk the possibility of its repentance and so the deflection away from the judgments of God. Yet the providence of God had caused him to, thro to be thrown overboard swallowed by a great fish, and vomited up on dry land. The Ninevites were in no doubt, amazed at the bleached appearance of one who had undergone such an experience. And so Jonah became a sign unto the Ninevites. Might also have been eyewitnesses on the Syrian coast who had seen something of this remarkable landing. At all events, none of it was spared and survived to become the agent whereby all the good works of Jonah's king, Jeroboam II, was destroyed. There was little reason why this people of Israel would cherish the memory of Jonah or welcome being reminded of his sign. It might have been part of their reaction to Jonah that they would proceed no, that they would propound the ridiculous statement that out of Galilee cometh no prophet. This would be a reason that they would give why Jesus, who did not arise from Galilee, in any case, should be rejected.
The idea of Jesus as the second Jonah was not very welcome to this oppressed and fanatical nationalistic people. This might have been at the root of the complaint of the Pharisees, found in John 11, verse 47, that if Jesus were left alone, all men, men of all nations, would believe on him. And as a result, the Romans would do to them what the Ninevites had done to Israel, and come and take away our place and nation. And there might have been the recollection of the same Jonah history that led Caiaphas to reply, it is expedient that one man should die for the people, that the whole nation perish not. Cast this man as the shipman cast out Jonah. There will be no miracle to bring him to life again, that he may continue his destructive promise to work among the Gentiles. Brother H.P. Bansfield gives us some commentary on the prophecy of Jonah. He says, To some Bible lovers, the book of Jonah is a great embarrassment. Has long been the favorite butt of skeptics, have so mocked at the story of the sea monster swallowing Jonah and later spewing, spewing him up on the coast of Syria that they wish it did not appear in the canon of Scripture. To them, there is nothing more in the book than the rather incredible record of Yahweh punishing a whimpering Jew who in his bigoted Judaism refused to, to perform the divine bidding to preach to the Gentiles and was in consequence disciplined and taught a corrective lesson. But there is much more the book than that. In fact, when properly considered, the book, record of Jonah is a glorious gem that sparkles among the string of pearls that make up the inspired library that we call the Bible. Because of this amazing prophecy and sign, that it portrays concerning the work of the Lord Jesus. When the true key to the understanding of the book is discovered, it is appreciated why the Lord made constant reference to it and exhorted his adversaries to consider the significant sign revealed in it. If they had heeded his words, they would have been able to access his true mission and may not have crucified their Messiah. Jonah, or Yonah, Y-O-N-A-H, is the Hebrew word for dove or pigeon. The dove or pigeon was the only bird offered in the sacrifice under the law was the offering of poverty for a sin offering or for a burnt offering, and was offered with a lamb at childbirth. In case of poverty, two birds were offered instead of a lamb, as was done 
in the case of the birth of Jesus. The dove was also used as a ritual for the cleansing of the leper. Well, the dove was a clean bird. It was said that the Jews never ate it because it was a unique in character and in sacrificial offering. The dove was used by the Lord as a symbol of harmlessness and when offered in sacrifice it emphasized the principle of innocence or perfection of character. This is a thing representing the Lord Jesus Christ. Like the sheep or lamb of which it was the equivalent among bird life, it not only represented innocence and harmlessness, but was also noted for foolishness when acting in moments of panic. In the Song of Solomon, the multitudinous bride of Christ is likened to a dove. The name Jonah, or dove, was therefore a significant one to the Jews, as is also to the Gentiles, for it is a common symbol for peace in both the great families of the human race. As among animals, the lamb or sheep was used to represent Israel. So among birds, the dove was used for the same purpose. The psalmist pleading for Israel declared, O deliver not the soul of thy turtle dove unto the multitude of the wicked. Forget not the congregation of thy poor forever. Using the same symbol, but speaking of the future glory of the nation, he said, Though it Though ye have lying among the pots, you shall be as the wings of the dove, covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold. In these terms, he portrayed Israel as Yahweh's dove, elevated from the degeneration of the pots and made resplendent with silver and gold the silver of redemption, and the gold of tried faith. The dove was a significant symbol when applied to Israel. It should have directed the minds of true Israelites back to the dramatic salvation of Noah in the time of the flood. After an appropriate interval, he sent forth a dove from the ark, the Ark of Salvation. But in Genesis 8 and 9, we read, The dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him, that is Noah, into the Ark. The dove was helpless outside of the Ark. It flooded panic-stricken and frantic over the waters of the stormy sea, finding no rest for the sole of her foot. Only in its shelter did it feel safe. How true this is of Israel, of whom the dove is a symbol. During the centuries of her dispersion, Israel, having the, left the Ark of Refuge, had been like the dove, fluttering fearfully and dreadfully over the stormy waters of the Gentile Sea of Nations. There's been no true rest for her, nor will there ever be, until the return of the man of rest.
and then shelter in the ark that only he can provide. So as the dove was used as a symbol of Israel, so the mission upon which Noah, I'm sure, mission upon Jonah, the dove, was set, illustrates the purpose that Yahweh had for his people. Yahweh designed that Israel should become the medium of his glory and his grace unto all nations. He required the same of Jonah, instructing him to preach repentance to the Ninevites. When Israel failed to accomplish Yahweh's purpose, He permitted the nation to be swallowed up of the Gentiles. So Jonah was swallowed up by the sea. To accomplish his purpose, however, Yahweh has preserved Israel and will yet bring her back in the political resurrection from her national grave. She will be spewed up out of the stormy waters of Gentile politics as Jonah was on the belly of the fish. After this political resurrection, Israel will prove a blessing to the Gentiles as Jonah proves to be to the Ninevites. Israel fails to manifest the trusting, innocent virtue of the dove, the dove that it symbolized. Hosea likens Ephraim as a silly dove without heart, fluttering, panic-stricken, from one nation to another, seeking for help and ignoring the power that could truly save it. Yet Yahweh from the beginning had determined to reveal unto men his ideal Israel, his true dove, and a man who would manifest to perfection these divine attributes that Israel failed to reveal. The man is the Lord Jesus Christ, called Israel by the Spirit, speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Yahweh hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name, and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. The Lord Jesus is called Israel because he is the ideal Israelite, the true prince with L, as in the word as the word signifies. He revealed all the divine virtues of Yahweh which have been set before Israel as their ideal. He is the true Lamb of God, the innocent and trusting dove. And this was brought home clearly to the people of Israel when he presented himself before John for baptism. John proclaimed that his mission was to prepare the way for the manifestation of the Messiah. He declared in the midst of Israel at that very time was one mightier than he, the latchet of whose shoes he was unheard, unworthy to unloose. In Jesus, that one was revealed. He presented himself to John for baptism, having no sin to confess, 
when the rite had been completed, and his real identity was revealed by a voice from heaven. Luke records, it came to pass that Jesus, also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. The Holy Spirit descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And the voice came from heaven saying, This art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove. Why a dove? Because this was the symbol of Israel. And then the Lord was to be witnessed the personification of the true Israel. The word dove, the start of onlookers, saw the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descending and settled on the Lord Jesus in the form of Jonah. Then as the spirit of Elijah had descended on Elisha, so the spirit of Jonah, the prophet, descended on the Lord Jesus. If the people of Judah had been spiritually alive to the significance of the sign of the prophet Jonah, they would have realized that the Lord was any type of the prophet about to fulfill the allegory significant of his mission. What did Jonah do that prefigured the mission of the Lord Jesus? He gave himself in sacrificial death. He was figuratively raised from the grave. He preached repentance unto Gentiles. The Lord Jesus either personified or through his disciples fulfilled this type. Although Brother John Carter in his book, The Parables of the Messiah, does not consider Jonah as a parable, Brother Thomas, however, helps to set out what is meant by a parable. He wrote in Alpha's Israel, Bible types and parables. A parable is the setting forth of a certain thing as the representation of something else. Hence, it is a comparison or similitude. It may be spoken or acted. In the former case, fiction is used to illustrate that which is real while in the latter, real action in a smaller scale are representative of remote and greater events. Whether spoken or acted, parables are dark and unintelligible to those who are not skilled in the things of the kingdom. But when once they come to comprehend this, the things they reveal immediately appear. To allegorize is to represent truth by comparison. For certain features of the kingdom of God to be illustrated parabolically is to speak or act allegorically and is a mode of instruction more calculated to keep up the attention and to impress the mind permanently than a set then is set then a set discourse. The scriptures are constructed after the ingenious plan by which they are made so much more interesting and capable of containing so much more matter than any other book of the same subject and of the same size. The proof of this is contained in one passage. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6, these things are examples 
They are types to the intent that we should not that we should not list lust after evil things so they so as they also lusted. Read you a little bit about Jonah's fish. The word in the Hebrew signifies monster and can relate to any great fish. The word in the New Testament signifies sea monster and is actually accurately translated in the RV margin as sea monster. Concerning whales, it has been noted there are only there are over 60 kinds different kinds of whales with teeth in the lower jaw. An example of this would be the sperm whale. And all with the exception of the Greenland whale have gullets in proportion to their size. The throat of the common sperm whale is capacious enough to give passage to the body of a man. Dying whales object, uh, eject the contents of their stomachs, usually several great masses of white, semi-transparent substance of huge size and irregular shape. It, it has teeth only in the lower jaw it is unable to masticate and therefore is compelled to swallow whole or tear into sizable pieces and then bolt completely. Witnesses have described masses of ejected food up to eight feet by six foot in size. There is no record for skeleton. There is on record the skeleton of a shark in a whale. 16 feet in length. One writer writing on Jonah described the experience of a sailor in the Mediterranean who was swallowed by a whale and then cast out alive and with little injury. The fish was 20 feet long, 9 feet wide, and weighed 4,000 pounds. Hastings Bible Dictionary refers to the, to the remarkable experiences of James Bartley, who was swallowed by a sperm whale near the Falkland Islands in 1891. The whale was caught and killed, the carcass drawn alongside of the ship, the blubber was removed throughout one day and part of a night, and on the next morning the stomach was hoisted onto the deck. The sailor was found doubled up inside, alive though unconscious. He had temporarily lost his reason. He recovered later to describe his experience. The awful darkness, the slimy yielding substance, the unbearable heat of his incarceration in the stomach of the whale. Another writer in the Academy of Science states a sperm whale can easily swallow an animal taller and heavier than a man. The animals, once swallowed, can keep alive some time in the whale's stomach. Even from the natural standpoint, therefore, there is no reason to dispute the possibility of Jonah's experience. But in the account concerning him, and of the sign he presented to Israel and to the world, we are in the presence of a miracle. I have a little analysis here of the book. Once we have lifted the book of Jonah out of the battleground of destructive criticism and have discerned the remarkable foreshadowing of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ presented therein, 
the experience of the prophet becomes the most exciting adventure in Bible in the Bible. The sign of the prophet Jonah prefigured the work of Christ. Jonah sacrificed himself for his people, experiencing a typical death and resurrection, and afterwards preaching repentance to the Gentiles. Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, as Christ was to his generation. Jonah preached that unless Nineveh repented, they would fall within 40 days. Christ did likewise to his generation, and within 40 prophetic days of years, Jerusalem fell before the onslaught of the Roman hordes. If the Lord's contemporaries had heeded the sign, it would have taught them certain facts concerning the death and the resurrection of the Messiah. They would have also learned that the time for repentance was limited, that which was afterwards preached to the Gentiles. They saw the, saw the sign at the Lord's baptism, as we noted before, and should have comprehended and heeded it, as Paul later did. Paul taught that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. What Old Testament Scripture might Christ told, showed that Christ was buried, a sign that he lived again on the third day, the answer is found in the book of Jonah. And we find it when we comprehend the sign that was presented there. There is a great deal more on the book of Jonah. We can continue. Anyone has the opportunity to read Brother Brother Mansfield's expose on Jonah? It would be well well worth that time. And we'll... uh, Finish with that. Anyone has any questions or comments?